Support for the Trailblazers.fm podcast comes from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, a national membership network that reminds us that there's no cavalry coming to save the day in our communities. We are the iconic leaders we've been waiting for, the curators of the change we're seeking to see. To learn more about the groundbreaking work of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, visit tbpod.com slash achievement. You're listening to the Trailblazers podcast, where we will explore the stories of successful Black professionals. Join us as we highlight the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished trailblazers to help provide the know-how, confidence, and motivation you need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen Hart. What's up, Blaze Nation? Welcome back to episode 104 of the Trailblazers.fm podcast. In case you missed it, we are talking and we've been talking money and building generational wealth for the month of January. Really looking at starting this new year off and gaining some wisdom gaining some mission fuel and arming ourselves with that financial literacy that's going to set us on a better course to blazer trail in 2018 and beyond. So in case you missed it, definitely go back and listen to episode 101, 102, and last week's 103. Very powerful episodes. And we're wrapping up this series with today's guest, who is simply amazing. Her name is Dr. Pamela Jolly. And Dr. Jolly is the founder and CEO of Torch Enterprises. She's helped thousands of entrepreneurs and different national nonprofits, trade organizations, the federal government, foundations, and financial institutions. List goes on, right? She's a smart and committed woman who is developing data-driven strategies that will hopefully help lead us to wealth as a legacy in African-American community. And so in today's conversation, Dr. Jolly and I talked about her meaning of the term legacy wealth and why that's so very important today. We talked about what needs to happen to shift us from looking at this gratification of the no to our perspective further down the road. And and we also talked through the steps involved to begin to chart our path toward legacy wealth and ownership. I won't delay us too much more. I'm going to ask you right now to hit your share button in your favorite podcast app and share this out with your network. And also, if you haven't done so, leave us a rating and review right now in your podcast app, especially on Apple Podcasts. It's going to help us with our ranking there. Let's dive into this conversation. I'm excited to get going and for you to hear and receive some mission fuel from our featured trailblazer for today, Dr. Pamela Jolly. Enjoy. Dr. Jolly, welcome to the Trailblazers.fm podcast. And thank you so much for being our featured guest today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Happy New Year. (laughs) So we met a little bit more than a month ago at CBMA's Mm -hmm. Rumble Young Man Rumble in Louisville. And I have to tell you, I heard you give your keynote and all I could think while you're talking was that I had to have you on the podcast to share some of your gems. So I really appreciate you sharing some wisdom with Blaze Nation. Well, I'm honored that you asked me and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. So I'm a person who finds comfort, if you will, and a sense of calm in the beginning of these conversations where we start things off from a place of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask if you'd be so kind to share an unexpected or expected blessing or event that, you know, from this past year that you're most grateful for. Yeah. You know, 2017 was a really good year for me. It really allowed me to push past some limits. And I think what I'm most grateful for is really staying true to the journey. You know, 2017 was my 13th year of being an entrepreneur. Wow. And yeah. And, you know, when you are able to survive and and thrive in the ebbs and throes of entrepreneurship, you really become adept to certain pivots that need to be taken. And so last year Mm. I decided to take a pivot and it was a big pivot for me in that I really enjoy working with my clients but there was something more that I wanted to do. And in being prayerful about it, I felt that 2018 was the time. And so in the back half of 2017, I made that pivot. And then doors just started to open. And the way the doors opened, it was just confirmation that, yeah, 
this was the time that the 13th year was time for a pivot. Wow. And so really, really grateful that one, I'm obedient, but two, that I remain true because, you know, for other entrepreneurs that are listening, it's not always easy. And I truly believe that entrepreneurship is a call. And if you accept the call, you accept uncertainty. And in that uncertainty, you need a faith to be able to move forward and to be successful. And I'm grateful that after 13 years, I definitely have that. Love it. So let's take it back a little bit. I know that you began your career as a banker and then you went on to become a strategist. And I wanted to ask, you know, growing up, did you always have this dream of being in the financial space, in the financial sector? You know, no. My dad was in technology. I learned how to type my name before I learned how to write it. (laughs) And I was always one that, similar to my dad, could just recognize patterns. And so really what brought me into financial services was a cousin who was a mentor of mine. And I was at Hampton University and I, to make the story short, I totaled two cars in six months. Wow. And my dad, <laughs> <laughs> and not to date myself, but, you know, a different world was on. And the episode <laughs> where <laughs> Whitley was spending too much money and her father cut up her credit cards. Well, my dad had seen that. So after the second car, he was like, look, I'm pulling all financial support because you clearly want to be in a car more in the classroom. And so... I had to work full time and go to school full time if I wanted to finish what I started. And so I sold car stereos at Circuit City, a hundred percent sales commission. And I was very good at it. I was selling thirty five to forty thousand dollars a year in car stereo equipment. And so when it came time to graduate (laughs) I remember my cousin called and said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, you know what? I just got an offer to be a sales manager at Circuit City. (laughs) And my cousin was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) And he was like, why do you want to do that? I said, well, you know what I'm selling? I'm really selling a lot and I'm making a lot of commissions. And so he said, so why don't you try selling the hardest product there is? Mm. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, money. And I said, is that legal? (laughs) <laughs> and he said, yes, it's banking. It's called banking. And I was like, oh, I said, well, I don't really know a lot about that. And he's like, well, just leave that up to me. Mm. And so he opened the door and I just started interviewing with all the banks and I selected Nations Bank wow. and I went into their management training program. And it was the best thing ever because I think that you really become a powerful person being able to analyze financial statements. Yes. And being able to understand, you know, where a business is going by looking at its numbers. That's awesome. You're bringing me back. <laughs> Nations <laughs> Bank and Circuit City. <laughs> Those yeah, are names I haven't heard exactly. in a while. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So today you're an entrepreneur, you're an author, and you're an amazing speaker. I had the pleasure to Thanks. hear you myself. And I'm sure you wear several other hats and have several other titles, but I also know that before, at least I'm thinking that before your time with Torch Enterprises, you spent some time in New Orleans helping the city to develop and execute a plan to rebuild, correct? Yeah, and that was after I launched Torch. So um, it was after, wow. Yeah, so after banking, I went to the Wharton Business School right. and then came out and was a financial services strategist in the strategy and business architecture department in New York. And that allowed me to travel really all over the world. And it was the end of the dot-com era. And it was very interesting to watch large financial institutions for a quick moment, a brief moment, think that startups would be able to unsettle them. And then from there, I went to market research strategy where I used to take billions of pieces of data right. and create these algorithms to blow up companies and then private equity and venture capital and then launched Torch. And then Torch was hired by FEMA post Katrina. And it was there I first went to Mississippi and underwrote over $200 million in resources for the municipalities there and then went over to the greater New Orleans area and co-authored the strategic assessment to rebuild New Orleans post-Katrina. And it was during that time that I really, really appreciated, and I still do. In fact, I'm in New Orleans right now. But I really appreciated what I learned in the five years I was in New Orleans post-Katrina because you know, a natural disaster impacted everyone in the city. And it allowed me to leverage my banking and my strategy experience to really look at cities as enterprises. 
mm-hmm. and look at communities as smaller enterprises and look at individuals as businesses as well. Wow. And to note, once again, coming back from my childhood, patterns. And so, you know, New Orleans is the oldest inhabited place in the country. African Americans were free before they were enslaved. And, you know, at the time of the storm, you had three generations of ownership in the African American community, but you had almost five generations of ownership in the majority community. And, you know, wealth looks different across generations. And I was really able to start to really believe to see, really see what it means when you have generation after generation passing the torch so that one is doing better than the other. And that's how I was raised. I was raised to do better than my parents. Mm. And they were raised to do better than theirs. And I started to see that when we don't have that as a standard, our communities get impacted differently, even when the storm hits everybody the same. Wow. I'm sure you grew up quite a bit as an entrepreneur, but also I'm sure that experience impacted you personally. How did that affect Pamela in that journey, in that time, in that season? Yeah, you know, when I started my company, I wanted to make a difference in the Black community. And when I got to go to the Southern Gulf Coast, you know, New Orleans was 87% African American. And there was a federal mandate, a multi-billion dollar federal mandate to rebuild. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. (laughs) I thought I I had found my purpose. I was like, praise God, like, this is what I prayed for. Mm -hmm. And so I started to realize how much I loved my community, how much I loved business, and how much in order for both my community and the business of my community to be successful, you needed to have a very strong faith. Mm -hmm. And I found my purpose in New Orleans. And it just became increasingly confirmed after leaving New Orleans and continuing my journey all the way to now. So I believe this followed your time there, but, and you're touching on it just now, you discovered this desire to integrate your faith and finance. And is that what led you to Boston to study theology? Yeah, I found that whenever, huge generalization, but this has been my experience, That just about anybody, when faced with a financial uncertainty or problem or crisis, they close their eyes and they believe in something. Mm -hmm. And it was that blind faith that often led people to become uber religious in times of business and financial situations. And I wanted to find a way to unblind people's faith. And there were, you know, a lot of churches here and a lot of faith-based organizations who came down to New Orleans to support, and they were all well-intentioned, but the business acumen really wasn't there. Mm. And because I came from the side of the government where we had funds to support the rebuilding efforts, but who's going to tell a church not to come down and do this work? And so there were things that we could have done differently, but we just didn't know how. And so it was no harm, no foul, but it really highlighted the need for me to better determine how to talk to people of faith about things of finance and business. And so I needed to be able to speak their language. I remember the pastors would say to me, you definitely know business and you love God, but you don't know God the way we know God. Mm. (laughs) And so I learned best in a classroom. So I decided to go to seminary. Because I wanted to build a systematic theology around money and wealth so that I could, you know, basically explain or educate the faith community around wealth creation and ownership and finance and business. Wow. So how did that education, you now as we move forward, how did that impact your vision and how is it driving you in the work that you find yourself doing today? So once again, the patterns. Mm-hmm. And so it was 2008 when I went to seminary. And it's a good time to get back in school. (laughs) (laughs) It was the, you know, the economic downturn was about, was taking its final crash. And um, and then we had the presidential candidate, President Barack Obama, right now, two term President Barack Obama. But, you know, he had a speech in Selma and it was one of his first speeches really announcing his candidacy. And he said that we were in a Joshua era and this Mm. was a Joshua generation. And as soon as he said it, my mind hit a pattern because it was 2008. In 1968, Martin Luther King self-identified as a Moses. And he had said he had been to the mountaintop and he had seen the promised land. And so the biblical narrative Mm -hmm. that took us from Egyptian slavery through the wilderness to the promised land was a 40-year journey. In 68 to 2008, 
was a 40 year journey. So I was like, wait a minute. Mm. Well, if this is our <laughs> social political context and what is the promised land? You know, how do we get there together? How do we fund it? And what, if anything, do you feel you need to learn to feel more confident of your pursuit? Became my discussion guide to really inquire of, you know, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. And I went to Boston University School of Theology, and that's where Martin Luther King went. And so they had most of his archives. So I was able to go and read his journals and read what he was thinking and read where he was stuck and measure the six-year journey from, you know, the boycott all the way to the March on Washington and the variety of different things. And so in looking at, you know, his journey and then looking at what was to be our president's journey, I just saw so many parallels in the biblical narrative of the promised land. And so that coupled with just the sheer makeup of the seminary curriculum where it wasn't until I got to seminary that I learned that an argument wasn't a fight. <laughs> an <laughs> argument <laughs> means to make clear. And, you know, the papers I had to write and the way in which I had to structure those papers was different from my business school education. But it forced me to really do the research and articulate what it was that I believed and why and substantiate it. So it allowed me to go so deeper than I had ever gone before. And one of the things that I did was I studied the last 180 years of the African American church. Mm. And I looked at it through a business lens. And so everything that I did was through this business lens. And while in New Orleans for five years, I was working on an algorithm that was trying to integrate faith and finance, but it was also trying to integrate black history and American history. And so the patterns just started to converge while in seminary. Wow. This is amazing. And I, I'm just picturing the fact that you're also this quant brain, you're this quant geek. So I, I, I'm <laughs> sure, you know, you're trying to put all this data together. And so is that what fueled you authoring The Narrow Road? Yes, in part. So one of my favorite professors in seminary, he was on loan from Princeton and he was teaching at Harvard. And one of the most beautiful things about Boston University is that you can go to all the seminaries that are up there. And so I attended Boston University, but I also had classes at Boston College and Harvard University. Girl, you and love and some Andover school. <laughs> I do. I, I learned best in a class. <laughs> but Dr. Peter Paris, who is Chairman Emeritus of Princeton School of Ethics, you know, he taught me liberation theology and black theology. And he was the one that really encouraged me to take this to a terminal degree. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you really have to take this further. And I was like, what is a terminal degree? And I'm he was wondering. like, <laughs> your doctorate, you have to get your doctorate. And I was like, what? I was like, I already have three degrees. And my dad's already told me that the longer I'm in school, the dumber I get. I said, I don't think I can do this. And he said, I think you have to. Because you have to, you have a very unique way that integrates, you know, our history, our faith with our finance, but the doctorate will help you structure that and ground that. Mm. And so the narrow road is really the byproduct of my dissertation research in which I interviewed thousands of people across the country about their relationship with money and their definitions of wealth and legacy all based on that discussion guide that I mentioned to you about the promised land. Mm -hmm. So it's an existential exegesis of Joshua 1 through 12, which is nothing short of just saying it's basically a culturally relevant way to approach corporately a biblical narrative using business and finance. And so the narrow road was the way in which I could disseminate it in a very simple way, as simple as I could get it, so that I could engage communities and individuals with the series of algorithms that I created. So that's how it came about. Wow. And so for everyone listening, the book is titled The Narrow Road, A Guide to Legacy Wealth. And so that brings me to our question here. What exactly does legacy wealth mean? You've shared, you've said it a couple of times in a call, but I'd love for us to be clear on what legacy wealth <laughs> represents. Sure. So, you know, wealth for too many people is just financial. Mm -hmm. Yet, having interviewed so many people, including eight billionaires, wealth is so much more than money. It in is. fact, in the narrow road, you know, only 20% of wealth is money. But when you put legacy in front of wealth, you change it dramatically because you convert it from an individual pursuit to a collective pursuit across generations. Mm. And so legacy wealth is a cross-generational business narrative that builds, grows, and expands if you connect the dots, if you find your own pattern, if you learn how your family has defined wealth, and you take it upon yourself to pursue your purpose to further it. And so that's what legacy wealth is. 
Interesting you say that, as I, I literally an hour before this conversation was having a talk with my dad and mm -hmm. another of his best friends who essentially took me in when I was 16 and moved from Jamaica to the States. And so he's a second dad. And they both were commenting on my role as a father, which I take very seriously. And my dad was just, you know, commending me on how good a job I'm doing. And I was sharing just tonight, I was sharing the fact that that didn't happen by me just being a good dad. That was the legacy of them both pouring into me, allowing me to learn from their good example and add to so that now I'm able to be an even better father to my two. But I love the principle you share here because it goes, I mean, the money, the money aspect of things, yes, it's important, but there's so much more that will carry for generations to come. So much more. And, you know, it, in my research, what I found is it takes three generations to build legacy wealth and only one generation to lose it. Mm. And it follows the biblical scripture, you know, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But we have four generations living right now. And in my research, if we can extend that beyond the three to the four, we can expand wealth as a standard. And so when you think about where society is right now, where, you know, we're three years into this statistic, but three years ago, it said that for the next 30 years, a trillion dollars is going to be transferred from the boomers to the millennials. Wow. But when you think about the African-American community and communities of color, that often does not include us. But think about the dynamics that are going to happen when, you know, certain segments of the millennial population are going to be flushed with cash and certain segments are not. If we only look at wealth through a financial perspective, some would think that it is impossible for anybody who isn't getting that type of an inheritance to be wealthy. But what that speaks to me is that we have got to be able to value what we have in a culturally relevant way so that we can define wealth for ourselves so that it is more attainable and start to build standards and benchmarks that we can hold each other accountable to. Because if not, we won't value ourselves and we'll constantly try to consume ourselves to a position that we can't afford. Love that. So help me understand here, how we, and I love the reference to the black community, but you know, sometimes I fear that we love, we enjoy the now too much in our community. And so I'm wondering, you know, how we shift from our gratification for the now to a perspective that's further down the road. You know, we have to raise awareness of what wealth really is. And for too many of us, it's uncharted territory, which is why I stress the need for us to define it our way. And so for me, you know, a lot of people talk about mindsets. What I found in my research is that your mind is the most independent thing you own. And so for someone else to feel that they can change somebody else's mindset, you might be able to do it for a short period of time, but as soon as you're gone, they will change their mind back. Mm. And so along the narrow road, what we focus on is shifting your perspective further down the road. And so I'm extremely excited about the beginnings of what I hope is a trend in our community. And one example I'll use is when Unilever acquired Sundial Brands, who is the parent company of Shea Moisture. Mm -hmm. They negotiated that Unilever also invest $50 million to help women of color entrepreneurs. Love it. And then in turn, the founder of Sundial mm -hmm. purchased Essence, Essence Magazine, Magazine back yes. from AOL. Yes. So when you, when you, when you start to think about the things that we are engaging in, when you think about Carol's daughter and when Carol's daughter accepted venture capital money, you know, she had to exit. So some people were upset that she sold, but the selling process started as soon as she accepted the capital. Mm -hmm. And what she said in an interview was so correct that our community is still yet very unaware about the role in which you build, grow, and expand. But we are really doing it now. And I'm hoping that that will influence people in our community to look further down the road, beyond consumption to the importance of savings, the importance of investment, the importance of return on investment, and the importance of transfer. Because it's about to get real fun. And I want more people to be able to participate. Right, right. And I'd love for you to maybe give us a peek into what that amazing 
algorithm and, and the, <laughs> the narrow road <laughs> method is about and maybe share a little bit of that potential. So what are maybe a few of the steps that we need to take to begin charting our own path towards legacy wealth and ownership? Sure. So the way the narrow road works is that there is a predictive modeling component at the beginning of it. And the name of the narrow road comes from the book of Matthew, yes. where it says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but now is the road that leads to life. Few find it and even fewer take it. And I wanted more people to find the narrow road. And then I really wanted you to take it. So the way in which you find your narrow road to wealth is one question and you get what is called a narrow road identity. And that identity becomes a wealth identity when you apply it to the road to wealth. Now, there are five steps along the road to wealth, vision, thought, action, speech, and outcome. What I found is that many of us, we all are doing something and all of our actions in some way are attached to an outcome. And what stands between the action and the outcome is how we communicate it. And some of us communicate in ways that everybody understands, but some of us communicate in ways that only a few of us understand. Mm -hmm. And a shared language around business and finance is very standardized. So when you don't use that language or when you can't distill your actions and the, how they connect to your outcomes in a way that is measurable and tangible, not just to you, but to others, mm -hmm. the people who don't understand you just kind of walk away. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot, which is why we're often siloed and individualized when it relates to our pursuits of wealth. But there's something that happens before the action or should happen before the action, and that's thought. Yeah. And it's important to think things through to the end. Now, the end has different dimensions. Along the narrow road, the first end is retirement. I need you to maintain a certain level standard of lifestyle throughout retirement. And I'm influenced by my observations. So after talking with thousands of people and having quantitative data of over 45,000 people that make up the narrow road, you know, I look at my parents and the way in which they were able to finance retirement. Mm -hmm. And I look at how in many ways they're outliers relative to their peers in their generations. Well, we're supposed to get better than that generation. And my parents did pretty well, but I want you to do even better. Right. And I want your children to do even better. So we've got to think through to at least retirement. Now, there's another step called vision. And vision is often people who are looking at us, the bigger picture. So they're looking at our consumption. They're looking at the outcomes that we want. They're looking at how some of us are thinking about it, but the bigger picture often eludes us. My grandmother said it's hard to see the full picture when you're posing for it. And we're all posing for some part of the picture. But those who can hold the master view, the macro view of our community, realize that we spend $1.2 trillion a year, but we only earn $947 billion a year, Ooh. which means that $247 billion Dead. is short-term high-interest credit card debt mm. to live for today and leverage tomorrow. And so the steps of the narrow road are important in terms of their sequential order. The first step is vision. The second step is thought. The third step is action. And then and only then do we talk about it because we've thought things through. And everything along the narrow road is anchored to an outcome that you believe in that is measurable, tangible, and within your capability of achieving. Each incremental outcome is addressing the four things that close the wealth gap between blacks and whites. And so this is a very measured, structured, calculatable process mm -hmm. that in the end, you really intimately understand the three statements that your life makes, your balance sheet, your income statement, and your statement of cash flow. I am speechless. <laughs> <laughs> this, listen, everyone listening right now, jump on Amazon or jump on Dr. Jolly's website. I'm going to let you tell everybody how they need to audit a book before we even take another step. <laughs> just just well, tell you, us how to get a copy right now. Sure. So if you are an ebook reader, Kindle, go to Amazon.com. It's a narrow road, a guide to legacy wealth. And if you are a hard copy, you can buy it on Amazon, but it's double the price that you will find on my website, which is PamelaJolly.com. 
And I'm going to hyperlink everything on the show notes page. So if you want, you can hop on over to tbpod.com slash Pamela Jolly. And the links will be right there for you. I want everyone to make sure you get a copy of that book. Dr. Jolly, this is amazing. I'm so happy that you have shared tremendous mission fuel and some nuggets of wisdom right here. And before I let you go, we'd love to tap into the resources of our guests. And I'd love to maybe have you share any other good books that you've read that you'd care maybe to recommend to our Blazer Nation. Sure. So I'm a corporate finance geek. (laughs) And so one of my favorite books that really breaks it down, because again, remember, I love patterns. It's called Value, The Four Cornerstones of Corporate Finance. Hmm. And that's by Tim Collier and Richard Dobbs from McKinsey. And I just really love how they go throughout the decades and pull out different examples of how these four cornerstones really impact. And again, I want every Everyone to understand. I look at everything through the lens of business. Mm -hmm. And so you yourself, anyone and everyone with a financial statement is in business. So corporate financial principles can also apply to you once you understand the basic principles of finance. And all finance is a stewardship of capital. And in the narrow road, you've got five capitals. And so understanding how to be a better steward is really one of the very big cornerstones of wealth. The other book that I love is not a finance book, but I think it's important to understand the macro and microeconomic realities of the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And this one is called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe. And I got the privilege of interviewing Neil Howe when I was in New Orleans. And these two men are brilliant. The first book they wrote was Generations. And they went all the way back to the 1500s and realized that every fourth generation repeats itself. And they created a predictive modeling component and then predicted what would happen now and wrote a book about now 25 years ago called The Fourth Turning. And it's dead on. Wow. And so it really helps you look at various different variables in our life equation from a different perspective, from parenting styles to economies to purchasing patterns. And so it really expanded my worldview and allowed me to engage the patterns in our community more openly. And then lastly, the third book, it's an old book, but Lord have mercy, it's one of my favorites. (laughs) And it's called Dangerous Dreamers. And Dangerous Dreamers, if you are like me, it's important to understand the historical significance of what we have today. And this one really shows you the initial financial dangerous dreamers that led to the Wall Street, that led to mergers and acquisitions, that led to a junk bond crisis. It really teaches you through the legacies of some financial giants that we don't often talk about anymore, but they really, their lived legacies and their pursuits largely have influenced the financial world that we have today. Wow. Our last question for this conversation is one I ask of all our guests, and that's what's one action that you think our community should take this week that's going to help them to blaze their trail? Yeah. So I think, you know, as we are in the beginning of 2018, and as there are a lot of things that distract us or can distract us, One of the things that I think you can do in what the second week of the first month of 2018 is to get real focused on what do you want to do differently with your relationship with money this year? And who do you need to share that with to make sure that they will hold you accountable to what you want to do? The other thing, and you didn't ask about this, but the other thing that I would say is I would love it if you would consider joining the journey with Torch Enterprises. This year, the pivot that I talked about is the launch of a Legacy Wealth Initiative, which is a national initiative that starts in the first quarter of this year as a local one. So I have collaborated with two of the baddest black men on the planet. One is Sean Dove of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Yes. And the other is Willie Barney of the Empowerment Network in Omaha. And so in Detroit, we are launching the Black Male Equity Initiative, where with a cohort of black men, we are testing out a unique curricula based on the 3,900 African-American men I interviewed to really explore various aspects of equity and the role it plays in wealth creation from a black male perspective. We're going to be able to chart a path to wealth our way. 
And in Omaha, we're going to test out the other curriculums that I have written. There were five targets that I interviewed, men, women, business owners, pastors, and millennials. And so a larger group is going to work with me in Omaha to explore what wealth can be as a collective and community. After quarter one, we will be sharing our insights in a national conversation. And I would love it if you would join our journey because it's important for us to not just talk about it, but to get very, very specific with what we can do together. Mm -hmm. And that's my desire. I'm going to do this work for the rest of my life. There's so much wealth that we can make right in our own backyards while elevating the standard of business to legacy wealth in our communities. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, Text 55498. That's the number, 55498. But text the word, keyword, legacy. And sign up, and I promise you that you'll be getting really fruitful materials, fruitful invitations, and who knows, you can bring the narrow road to your city after we have proven how powerful it can be in the two cities with the two wonderful, brilliant Black men that I've partnered with for 2018. I can't wait to get off this call only so I can send my text message early. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Jolly, this has been an awesome conversation. I can't thank you enough for being part of our Blazer Nation and being a featured guest. You're now part of our family and, you know, we're so excited about what you are doing and what we look forward to with some of the work you're continuing to do and this initiative. So thank you so very much and God bless you this year as you step into blazing a new trail. Well, God bless you too. And thank you so much for what you're doing. You know, raising awareness of trailblazers makes you a trailblazer in your own right. So I'm grateful to be a part of the family now and I look forward to what the future brings for us all. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I'll be posting links to all of today's book recommendations and links mentioned on our show notes page at tdpod.com. If today was your first time listening to the Trailblazers podcast, I just want to extend a warm Trailblazers welcome to you. We're so happy to have you here and we encourage you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and browse through some of our past episodes to keep the knowledge flowing. If you're a fan of the podcast and today's content, and you're maybe already subscribed to the podcast, please continue to share and invite your friends, your family, your colleagues to listen to an episode that you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories will be moved to make significant changes that will have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday by about 5 a.m. Eastern. Trailblazers, jump off this podcast today. Go find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Cheers. Cheers.